And now on BBC One, Michael Aspel is ready to spring a few surprises. Here, aboard motor vessel Sir Thomas More, on the Thames at Teddington Lock, a little reunion is taking place. Past members of that much-loved, long-running Sunday evening drama series of the yachting world, Howard's Way, are gathered here with others to help me to surprise two more members of that long-running series. In here is one of the British theatre's greatest love stories. It's been running for nearly 60 years, and it's still going strong. This couple have been brought to Thames Television Studios, which is a short walk across the gangplank for an interview about their lives in the theatre. But first of all, they'll be coming on board for a little light refreshment, which suits me very well. <laughs> well, Dulcie and Michael, somebody said something just now which really was rather prophetic because it's Howard's Way and lots of other things here today and they're all here so that I can say, Michael Dennison and Dulcie Gray, today this is your life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one of you was saying something like that as you walked in, and in, you, indeed you're right. There is no interview across the road for you, no. just a party with all your friends, well. talking about your long voyage through life together, well. so far. Well, yeah. gracious, familiar faces everywhere. <laughs> Well, welcome ashore, and uh, thanks again to our friendly press gang. Well, Michael Dennison and Dulcie Gray, I think I can safely say this is your life in the singular because it is a life that you've shared since your wedding day on April the 29th, 1939. Dulcie, I believe that Michael spoke a few prophetic words after the ceremony. Yes, he did. Uh, we were rather tired anyway because <laughs> I was still at dramatic school um, five days before we became married. Michael was acting uh, in London, and um, when we came back down the aisle, Michael turned to me and said, oh, darling, isn't this lovely? One minute on the way to our golden wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never felt so exhausted in my life. <laughs> well, you were also a minute into a partnership which has made you the best-known couple in the English theatre today. Over half a century, you've played scores of roles together. There's a hosepipe down in force, madam. Not until tonight, there isn't. Oh, Francis, you gave me a shock. <laughs> you damn near gave me a soaking. Still, there's nothing new about that for a naval officer. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't expecting you till 12. Oh, well, I thought I might as well come along early so that you could brief me about what horses I'm going to back this afternoon. We can do that when we get to the race course. First, I want you to give me a hand. I was hoping to finish weeding that bed over there before I left. Rachel. Nothing. I'm tired, that's all. I've seen you tired before. What's made you unhappy, Rachel? I'm not unhappy, Jonathan. It's just that tonight you made me so proud of you. Rachel. Oh, Ricky. It's so good to see you. Tell me about the opera. Make me see it. Not now, darling. We'll get you down to the hospital as quickly as possible. You don't go too far away from me again, will you? Oh, that was so romantic. And uh, romance was certainly in the air one certain evening in Hong Kong. You were appearing in a play and celebrating your 40th wedding anniversary. Your producer friend had an idea for a romantic surprise. 
Yes, a champagne toast to them from the whole audience while the orchestra played the anniversary waltz. The old softy Derek Nimmo. Oh. Jerry, was that as, as beautiful as it sounded? Well, it was, actually. I mean, to be married 40 years is a very long time. And the day started off with champagne and oysters going to your suite. And then when they got the final cut of the play, it was dinner theatre, so I was able to arrange things like this. The orchestra played the anniversary waltz, and you both waltzed around the stage together. <laughs> and waiters were then primed, carrying trays of champagne. And they, all the audience got a glass of champagne. And that moment, the doors at the rear of the ballroom opened, <laughs> and in came the Hong Kong police band. It's <laughs> full strength. 42 piece orchestra playing congratulations yeah. and I we wish all that other employers of actors had the same idea of, of celebration of their, their employees <laughs> thank you darling for that and well, for everything thank you yeah. many congratulations thank you very much <laughs> well michael dennison and dulcie gray this is your life the fact that you met at all has all the ingredients of 30s drama Michael, you were born in Doncaster in 1915, son of a paint manufacturer, and christened John Michael Terence Wellesley Dennison. Your mother died soon after your birth, and you were brought up by relatives in London. Dulcie, you were born 7,000 miles away on a November day in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, third child of an English-born lawyer, and christened Dulcie Winifred Catherine Savage Bailey. Enough names for five people between you, I think. Now, you were sent to a boarding school in England when you were only four, and you didn't see your parents again for another four years. And your father was killed in an accident in Malaysia when you were only 16. Michael, you two went to boarding school, in fact, to Harrow, so neither of you were brought up by your respective parents. Do you think that could be a reason for your being so close, Michael? Well, I, by the time we got married, we were, to all intents and purposes, orphans. We therefore needed each other, perhaps specially, and, uh, but I don't actually recommend it as, uh, I mean, the loss of parents uh, could have been traumatic, but I was very lucky. My aunt and uncle were the most wonderful foster parents to me and looked after me quite beautifully and I had a wonderful home. Uh, Dulcie was reft from hers, of course, as an absolute baby. And well, I wasn't so good, I ran away from home, by rickshaw. <laughs> that was after you got back. <laughs> Well, you might as well do it in that. style if you've got to go. Uh, Michael, as a youngster at Harrow, your stage career got off to an unusual start. Uh, yes, I, well, I suppose it did, really. I'd, I'd done no acting at my uh, preparatory school at all, although the headmaster actually prophesied that I would be an actor. This was astonishing. I don't know on what evidence, because there was no acting that went on at all. However, at about the age of 15, I was doing my prep in my study at Harrow, and uh, Dorian Williams, who you may remember for his show-jumping commentaries on television, he, he was Harrow's best actor, and he was about two or three years older than me. He came into my room and said, Dennison, I wonder if you'd like to be in the house play. So I said, I have no idea. What do you want me to do? He said, I'd like you to play Aunt Emily. <laughs> and so began my career as a female impersonator, which was only cut short by my voice breaking when I was actually rehearsing to play Lady Teasel. Oh, we have the picture to prove uh, the story you just told us. <laughs> and quite ravishing you are as well. That was a bereaved mother uh, at the White House during the American Civil War. Oh, <laughs> well, there we are. Michael, you go to Oxford to read modern languages, but your performances with the Dramatic Society convince you to go to drama school. And Michael, if I hadn't changed your mind about which drama school to go to, you might never have married Dulcie. And that crucial role in your lives was played by Pam Rose. Pam, you were at the Weber Douglas Drama School, and how did you persuade Michael to go there? Well, Michael was a friend of my brother's at Oxford, and he came to stay the weekend that they came down from Oxford. And I was having a wonderful time at the Weber Douglas. There was one grave disadvantage. That was that we were, I think, about 15 girls to every one man. <laughs> and those men weren't nearly as handsome as Michael. So... <laughs> I think that was what really persuaded him most of all. And of course, among all those girls was Dulcie. And that was the beginning of a great romance. Oh, thank you, darling. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Pam Rose. Thank you. Now, Dulcie, you'd arrived at drama school in London via some real-life 
drama. The family fortunes collapsed when the Malaysian rubber industry was hit by the slump. He returned to Malaysia to teach in a jungle mission school. But the chance offered to be a nanny to a family returning to England meant you could go to drama school in London. And Michael, you were cast together in a student production of Parnell. Was, uh, was that a love story? Uh, well, it was, because Parnell was very much more confident than I was. I was in love with Dulcie, but I was in the inhibited 30s. I was far from being able to tell her so. However, Parnell, I, I, thanks to Parnell's dialogue, I had her in my arms and could tell her I loved her. And uh, there was an exchange of dialogue in which he said, um, uh, do you always wear white roses? And she replied, they only bloom at this time of the year. And I said, I shall have them grown all the year round for you. So when the performance came, I decided I had to get white roses. But in March 1938, it wasn't easy to get roses, and, and they were very expensive. And eventually I found six white roses at seven and six each, <laughs> which was far too much for a drama student. However, I scraped the bottom of the barrel and gave them to her. And then, instead of saying to Dulcie with love from Michael, I said to Kitty, which was the name of her character, from Charles Stewart, who, which was uh, Parnell's Christian names, and just before the curtain went up on the only performance, she came in bearing my roses, looking radiant, and said, Michael, would you believe it? I haven't seen him for years, and look what dear old Charlie Stewart has said. <laughs> <laughs> After all that. <laughs> well, you made your uh, professional debut together in Hay Fever at Her Majesty's Theatre in Aberdeen. But the outbreak of war meant Michael's call-up and posting overseas. Meanwhile, Dulcie, your career blossoms with a major role in the hit West End play Brighton Rock. And your co-star would like a word, Richard Attenborough. Hello, Dulcie and Michael. I remember those days, of course, just as much as you do. I remember Brighton Rock, but I also remember Little Foxes, which we did together. It must be 52, 53 years ago. Um, I think that we in the profession all remember you. Uh, for your dedication to the theatre. I don't mean just theatre uh, in the West End, but I mean theatre throughout the country. Your absolute committed belief that the theatre was a vital part of the arts in this country, a vital part of our society, and that by the immense amount of touring that you have given to a huge public, at some sacrifice to yourselves, you really have established yourselves as one of the truly memorable husband and wife partnerships of British theatre, and I congratulate you. Thank you, Lord Dickey. <laughs> well, by the time Michael returned from his war service in 1946, Dulcie, you'd already made seven films. You were visiting Dulcie at the film studio when you were asked to stand in to play a scene with her. A year later, the studio's chief casting director, Bob Leonard, looked through those screen tests and cast Michael with you in the first million-pound box office hit in the UK, My Brother Jonathan. Next came The Legend of the Glass Mountain. In the late 40s and early 50s, you became two of the most popular stars in British cinema, along with another couple who talked to you from Sydney, Australia, John McCallum and Googie Withers. Oh, oh no, darling. I was thinking, Michael, uh, in a way, our lives have been a bit parallel, haven't they? Drama school in, in London, and then English rep, and then uh, the war, different places, but the army, and then British films, you with, of course, associated British, as with rank, and then while you were turning out all those Boyd QC so well, I was churning out skippies in the antipodes, uh, married to uh, look-alikes, still married to look-alikes. <laughs> Oh, Michael and Dulcie, I wish we were with you, but have a happy day. See you soon, I hope. Yes, bye-bye. John and Googie, thanks. <laughs> and Dulcie, in the 50s, as well as your stage work, you started writing. There have been more than 20 books to date. Michael, you did a season with the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1955, and that was when you met an actor who was a good friend to this day. And Michael, after your experience in the School for Scandal, I'm delighted you're still around. Of course, Donald Sindon. <laughs> Donald, Michael had a lucky escape. Uh, well, well, indeed, we did several months on, in uh, production of The School for Scandal, and it was wonderful. And uh, there was a certain occasion in the play when the three of us had to drink uh, wine from a very old bottle and this had been made covered with cobwebs and everything. 
and the drink was actually made from Ribena, if you remember that. <laughs> and we had to keep pouring out and knocking them back. And one night as I poured them out, I noticed little bits of something floating around in the glass. And the next night there were even more bits floating around, and the next night even worse. And I discovered that the, they'd got a new assistant stage manager who'd been told to top up the bottle, which we, she'd done without cleaning it out first. And we were drinking neat uh, penicillin. <laughs> 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 Donald, thank you. See you, Donald. Now, a young actor was cast with you, Dulcie, in Time and the Conways in 1976. It was a particularly happy time because you and Michael had close ties with him and his wife, which is why they're here tonight. Anthony Andrews and his wife, Georgina. So, Anthony, Michael and Dulcie were great friends of Georgina's parents. They were indeed. They were indeed. Congratulations, Michael. Uh, you have to realize that for Georgina's parents, getting my, Georgina getting married to a disastrously out of work, very poor young actor was uh, quite a shock. And uh, for me, it was, it was quite a lifeline to discover that amongst their many acquaintances were two people who I had admired on the stage and screen for years and years and years. But when I finally came to work with Dulcie, you performed the miracle in turning things around with Georgina's parents because you managed to persuade them that there was at least one tiny iota of talent somewhere deep down and that I would be okay someday. So for which I shall be eternally grateful to you. I can't tell you how much I've valued your friendship for nearly 30 years. Thank you, my darling. Thank you. Thank you. Now, 20 years ago, Michael, you took on a role totally different from any you'd played before. You played Pooh Bar in the operetta The Black Mikado. And, Michael, you astonished us all with the way you waved your maracas. With the full details, Patty Boulay. <laughs> Hello, Michael. Good to see you. Patty, tell us about Michael's dexterity. Uh, well, Michael was, I mean, he out calypsoed everyone in the show. I mean, he just brought the house down every night. Well, and, Dulcie, when Michael was on stage, I used to sneak around and have a long chat yeah. with Dulcie. And I remember you told me, because I was very insecure at the time, mm -hmm. and I was new in the business, and I said to you one night, I said, I'm not quite sure that I, this is the right business for me, because I think I'm too shy. And you said, darling, everyone is. And that's why we are so good in the business, and I'll never forget it. Because <laughs> I stayed with it, and I'm glad I did. Oh, thank you, Dulcie. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 1956, Michael, you became a, an early star of television in Boyd QC. You made 80 episodes over seven years. And, Dulcie, you made a guest appearance. On stage, you appear together in The Importance of Being Earnest. And Oscar Wilde's grandson, Merlin Holland, is here, and he became a great friend. In 1960, you also break West End box office records with Candida. You were back in the West End only the other evening to see a friend's opening night. Yes, it's nice to have friends who come round afterwards to give you notes on your performance. <laughs> Co-starring in Rattigan's In Praise of Love, Peter Bowles. <laughs> Mm. How wonderful. <laughs> How wonderful. How wonderful. Peter, getting notes from friends, was that an ironic remark? Well, it was a, a loving joke between uh, uh, Michael and I. I had the great joy and delight of working with uh, Dulcie and Michael in Pygmalion um, last year. And Michael played um, Pickering and was an enormous uh, help to me and uh, did quite seriously uh, give me little thoughts and ideas, which helped me enormously. And I was teasing him about this. He came to see the first night of Impressive Love. And I was teasing him about this, and uh, we had a little laugh, and he, he broke towards the door and said goodbye, and then turned back and said, oh, by the way, I have got a little note for you. And he gave me a, a really succulent one, which I incorporated immediately into my performance. You it's did. working very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Let me remind you now of another opening night, one of your own. It was November 1993, and the play was An Ideal Husband. And you were an ideal couple to play in it. West End producer Bill Kenwright. Uh. 
<laughs> Bill, what's your memory of that opening night? Well, West End, but it was actually at Leatherhead we opened the play, and uh, they're really terrifying events, uh, first performances. And I arrived there, went to the bar first, and Peter Hall standing at the bar saying, we haven't had enough time, we can't go on, sweat dripping from him. I go through the pass door uh, into the uh, stage door area, and Martin Shaw, with 14 stone of padding, is walking up and down, saying, I'm from Birmingham, I can't play Oscar Wilde. I walk into the first dressing room, Hannah Gordon and Anna Carter are trying to get corsets on, pushing their boobs up, saying, we're not ready, Bill, we're just not ready. <laughs> I knock on the door of the next dressing room. These two are sitting there on a sofa, holding hands, the dog in front of them. I say, how are things? They say, darling, it's wonderful. Would you like a cup of tea? <laughs> <laughs> but the calmness that you mentioned didn't extend, of course, to the performance on stage. It wasn't supposed to. Was it, Father? And he should know he played your son. It is Martin Shaw. Oh. You've lost weight. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Martin, was it, was it frantic out there? Now, they, these two were parents to all of us, you see. We're all running around and everybody feels balmy and terrified and they're so calm. And Michael, being a director, of course, gives you wonderful notes. And oh. he gave me some wonderful ones, too. I remember something particular. Uh, I think it was your 77th or 78th birthday at Richmond. And, and it was the last Saturday matinee and we were all absolutely exhausted. And we were flogging up the stairs and at Richmond there were about four flights. And suddenly you came running through <laughs> and said, it's my 77th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> you ran straight up past us. And we all then had to carry on, you know, because you'd set such a wonderful example as always. <laughs> Bill and Martin, thank you very much. Thank you. One of our finest actresses is also a great friend of yours, although amazingly you've never worked together. But she has a few lines to deliver to you tonight. Dame Wendy Hiller. Dulcie, Michael, congratulations. Congratulations on this evening and on a wonderful career behind you. I can't think of really any other couple now that the Cassons, Sir Lewis and Dame Sybil aren't with us anymore, who have a reputation as you have. Many, many years of distinguished playing in all aspects of the arts together and forming a team, the Denisons, and how proud you must be of that. I think I've talked quite enough, but I do hope you understand that I do give you all my heartfelt congratulations and good wishes for the future. Wendy. Thank you. Now, I mentioned earlier your world tours with Derek Nimmo. One date took the two of you back to Dulce's birthplace, Kuala Lumpur. And we two will never forget the way you two dealt with a certain press conference. And the two in question are Simon Williams and Lucy Fleming. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time with the four of you, doesn't it? Now, Simon, what was so memorable about that press call? Well, they're always tricky occasions, these things, and um, we were sitting there, and uh, the first journalist put his hand up, and he said, uh, Mr. Dennison, can you tell me why you're so old? <laughs> and he consulted with Dulcie, and then after a little conflab, he answered with his usual ineffable charm, I think it's probably because we were born so long ago. <laughs> That's a very sweet answer. Lucy, you've worked with Michael quite a bit. Yes, I've worked with Michael, I think, four times now, and um, we've had various relationships. I think uh, you've been my father, my boss, yeah. my lover, and I think my favourite, my uh, Dottie Bishop that you oh, played. <laughs> yes. But each time, you and Dulcie together have always been so unfailingly helpful and generous and kind and charming, but most of all, such fun to work with. Yeah, God yeah. bless. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we're here now from one of your oldest friends at 91, he would be, Sir John Gielgud. Oh. Dear Dulcie and Michael, I only worked with you twice, unfortunately, once at Oxford when we were doing Richard II with, the, with a student group in 1937. And at the beginning of the war, when I did a little play with Dulcie called 
I think nursery slopes or something about some young people uh, having a holiday abroad, which was done at the Westminster Theatre and was quite fun. And since then I've watched your careers, both of you, with such affection and pleasure and know how much you are loved in the profession by all the people who have the joy of working with you. I'm sure this program will give you as much pleasure as it gives me to send this little message to you. Thank you, Sir John. In uh, 1983, you were both honoured with the CBE on the same day. And now I have a, a fan letter. It's no ordinary fan letter because it's from the Queen Mother with a request that I read it to you. And it, it reads, I was delighted to learn of the tribute which is being paid to you this evening, for you have both had such wonderfully successful careers on the stage and screen, and you have given immense pleasure to so many people, including myself. I send you both my warmest good wishes. Now, another couple who are good friends, like you, they are actor and authoress, married in 1941. So compared with you, they're newlyweds, Sir John and Lady Mills. Now, John, you have a memory about Michael being switched off, I believe. Uh, yes, I have, yes. Um, it's, uh, some time ago, uh, I was sent a very funny comedy uh, called At the End of the Day by Willie Douglas Hume. Uh, it was a lovely part for me, a long part, and a uh, very funny part, and uh, uh, to play Harold Wilson. And you were offered Mary Wilson, also a long, lengthy, very funny part. And Michael was offered a smaller part. Very funny part, but smaller. And you rang me the next day and said, look, can we have a chat to Michael? Because we really want him to play the part. I mean, he's a superb actor, but can we have a talk to Michael about the length of the part? So you invited me to dinner, and Mary and I went up to Charlotte, had a lovely dinner, and then I went to work on Michael. I said, Michael, it isn't the length so much, it's, it's what the part contains, but you may have remembered that in Act One, you're on the television as Ted Heath, and you have 10 minutes and you have three very, very big laughs on the telly. I said, we talk about you the entire time, but that is really, to have three big laughs without being there, being in the dressing was simply wonderful. I went to town, so Michael said, he'd do it, right. Well, about uh, three months later, it happened, I was hit, a few months later, one wonderful evening, you went and switched him on, switched the television on, came back and sat on the sofa with me, and about a minute later, he was just starting, you got up and started, went, went to switch him off. <laughs> and I just caught you. Just go, save the marriage. One of your greatest things. So simply marvellous. So just keep going and don't stop. God bless you. Michael Dennison and Dulcie Gray, this is your life. Esther Ransom salutes some real life acts in courage and kindness, hearts of gold in half an hour. And in a moment on BBC One, the big stories, here and now.